Good morning. Yeah, my, my name's Steve Curran. I'm the councillor in Zion Ward. I'm the lead of uh, the London Borough Council. And my address is the Civic Centre. Good morning. Um, I'm Lily Bath. Um, I'm a councillor here in the London Borough of Hounslow and I'm the adult member for Adult Social Care and Health in Hounslow and my address is um, London Borough of Hounslow Civic Centre, Hounslow. You should find in front of you a bundle labelled Volume 1. Um, pages 21 to 44 contain your submission. Can you please <coughs> confirm that it's true to the best of your knowledge and understanding and you wish it to stand as your evidence to the Commission? Yes. Um, I, I want to ask, to begin with, about the aspects of shaping a healthier future that uh, the London Borough of Hounslow supports. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, the uh, local authority is in favour of West Middlesex becoming a major hospital. Um, but what you also say is that you endorse um, Charing Cross Hospital becoming a local hospital. Now, are you content with the level of clarity about exactly what services are going to remain at Charing Cross Hospital? No, I think that's been one of our major concerns that, uh, and you're quite right when you say uh, we'd have been plain daft not to support our local hospital uh, becoming a major hospital, uh, and that's still our position of course, uh, but we are concerned about the uh, type, range and level of services in the uh, other hospitals in our area. and. Because there hasn't been clarity, there's been uncertainty, uh, that's raised the, uh, certainly the local authority, our concern. So when you say that you support that change to a local hospital, do I take it that that is contingent upon more information and you're being satisfied about what services are to remain? Yes, I think all, all through this period of change, and it's been already alluded to here today, that... Um, it's taken so long to push forward with the case for change and implement that change that things have changed in the interim. Um, and we've got huge population uh, increase in Hounslow. I don't think that's been taken into consideration. Uh, we've got uh, increases in waiting time over the four hours at Westmead. Uh, so generally the picture has significantly changed over the preceding three years, uh, which, is less, which has led to more uncertainty on our behalf. And, uh, my personal view is that there is, at the strategic level, little or no engagement with local authorities. We obviously engage with our CCG through the Health and Wellbeing Board and through senior officers, but there has been no engagement with this authority uh, through my office with regard to the merger of Chelsea and Westminster and West Mead, and that's something we're picking up. But I think that's the, the litmus test for how the, the Health Service deals with local authorities, particularly in London, and I'm also concerned, and I know other leaders in, in um, North West London and across uh, uh, the whole of London are concerned with the formation of what I would call the super CCG, where you get the cluster of CCGs come together and then they are deciding on healthcare and how it's provided for our residents without any formal engagement with the local authorities. I want to ask. Sorry. Could, could you keep your voice up? Uh, it's actually diffused a bit. Uh, I know that, yeah, some people were saying they can't hear. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Charing Cross because, of course, the proposals involve a change to the A&E service. Uh, and I wanted to ask you how those changes sat with the view that you expressed, and this is at page 27 of your submission, that Hounslow does not support the closure of further acute provision across north-west London. Can you help us with how the two things marry up, please? Okay. Thank you. Um, in our submission, um, we, in, our, in, in the original proposals, we supported the option of um, su supporting um, our local hospital, West Middlesex University Hospital, uh, to become a major hospital and Charing Cross as a local. And um, we broadly supported those proposals uh, because we understood the, um, the demands on the health service and the need to um, have uh, a good quality care and to be able to have a sustainable <coughs> health service. However, um, the recent, re the recent um, indications in terms of the uh, waiting times at A&E at West Middlesex has um, caused concerns for us 
and um, also, as um, the leader mentioned earlier, the fact that we still don't have any clarity over uh, what would be what would remain at Charing Cross. So at this present time, we don't wouldn't support the closure of further acute hospitals because if we are seeing this rise in um, waiting times now, when um, uh, Charing Cross is still open and that, that causes concern for us and um, our, our um, support of the proposals originally was that we felt that this would get, give a better deal for our residents in Hounslow in terms of supporting um, West Middlesex University Hospital as a, as a major hospital. Um, Bearing in mind the proposal for Charing Cross is for there to be, uh, and whether it's described as an A&E or an urgent care centre, we know it's going to be different from its current shape. Um, do you have any views about whether there needs to be a full A&E co-located at that hospital? I, I think we'd have to see the evidence for that, uh, either for or against. Um, but what we've got to be uh, assured of, and this goes for all of the boroughs involved, that the uh, business case and the rationale for that is clear, it's transparent uh, uh, and it stacks up at the moment because of all the changes, because of the change in population, the change in way health services are being delivered, the increase uh, waiting times for GP appointments etc etc. We're moving we think to a perfect storm uh, where we will, cannot guarantee uh, even if uh, Charing Cross had a, a, a full A&E or an urgent care centre, would that still meet the, the demand because of the, I think, the premature closures of the other two A&Es, which, for, uh, from our information, uh, and it would be for the Commission to decide why there was a spike in uh, A&E uh, attendances, uh, sorry, over the waiting time, four hours, in September of, of last year. So we, we, we need to look at that. But I don't think the case is made either way yet. Now, moving on, you also support West Middlesex being acquired by Chelsea and Westminster. Can, can you help with what you say this will achieve and why, please? Well, I, to be frank, I'm not sure we do support it because we've not been engaged in the process, as I mentioned earlier. Um, obviously, we're informed via our CCG, uh, but this authority has no, has no formal consultation uh, with anyone in the health service about that merger. And I think that's a fault. So is it fair to say that that is not something that you have yet decided upon as a borough? No, we haven't, because we haven't had the conversation with the local health authority. Now, in principle, um, the submission that you've put in suggests that you, su you support a shift from acute services to out-of-hospital services. Um, can you just clarify, is that support based on an acceptance that the increase in out-of-hospital services will actually have the effect of reducing the need for, for, for acute services? I think the premise is right and the rationale is right, but what we haven't seen, and it's been alluded to by Council Collins earlier, there is no evidence that the infrastructure in place will support those changes, and that is our main concern. So should they be decoupled? Should the out-of-hospital services be looked at on a standalone basis? No, I think if we're looking at health service for our residents in Hounslow across London, it needs to be joined up and it needs the local authorities, uh, the third sector, everyone involved in that dialogue about how services should be, should be provided. But um, at the moment, I, I, I think uh, there is a disconnect <coughs> between community services and acute and I couldn't support any further closures as an A&E uh, until we understand that, that connection and what it looks like. And we have to integrate services. We're not going to change either in local government or the health service. We think it's an imperative for both organisations to embrace change. We've got a very difficult financial situation, in both in local government and, and in the health service, which isn't going to get any easier. And that's the thing that we should remember. We've done this in... Uh, these proposals were uh, kick-started at a time where the financial position was different. It has got far worse and it is dire. If I can just add, yes. um, we do um, broadly support the out-of-hospital proposals. I mean, they're absolutely, we believe that it's absolutely crucial in terms of improving health care for our residents. Um, but as, as the leader has said, that what we really want to see and what we would expect 
is to see some of the results and um, successes of that. Mm. So um, in terms of the elements of, of, of what the proposals are, they're all very sound. And um, in terms of our relationship with the CCG as a council, we've got very, uh, we have very strong working relationships. Um, as an example, um, in terms, particularly in terms of health integration, we understand that is the way forward in terms of improving health. And um, we recently, in fact, just before um, a few weeks before Christmas, we um, opened up a, a seven-day hospital social work service, which basically uh, provides more social workers, council social workers, in the hospital, uh, which helps with um, uh, transfer. Um, discharge of patients rather at, an, at a timely fashion so that they're not delayed as a result of adult social care. So that's a really good piece of partnership working but however it's important to stress that that has only taken place uh, literally uh, before Christmas so you would need, although early the signs are that that is showing success, I think the point I want to make is that you'd want to see success of a lot of other things in place uh, before you started looking at a closing other acute provision. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to come on to that because, of course, in your submission, you do say that readiness and capacity are an issue, but on the other hand, you say that progress is being made. Um, now, looking at the CCG document that you attached, um, it's clear, isn't it, that some of those, um, some of those initiatives are still pilots. Uh, and some, for example, the, the, um, the diabetic intermediary care, that's still in its infancy, isn't it? So are you as an authority clear about the scale of the services which are currently up and running? I think um, we understand the service, we understand what has to be done and we understand the proposals and the principles that they are sound, but as you quite clearly say, I think it's very early stages because a lot of these um, uh, services have to be embedded. For example, the service that I've given you about the hospital social work service early signs up that it's it, that it, it's showing a lot of success. However, there are lots of other services that are um, proposed for 1516. And for an example that I give in terms of um, access to GPs, uh, etc., a lot of our residents tell us that they have difficulty in accessing GP services. So, if residents are having difficulty accessing GP services, the likelihood is that they're more likely to use acute services. And, you know, I, this is, I have a, an example in terms of my own case of not being able to access my GP over the summer last year and then having to, to, to use uh, A&E hospitals. So I think if that's what we're hearing from our residents, then that is a, a concern that we feel that as, as leaders in our communities that we, we need to raise and need to ask questions. Now, you also raise what you describe as a lack of agreed metrics against which to judge the success of the out-of-hospital services. Uh, so, uh, does it follow then that um, although, for example, the CCGs may give you specific data uh, about what services they're offering, they don't give you, or you're not made privy to, a way of measuring whether or not that service is actually effective or not. Is, is that, is, have I got that right? No, I don't think you have. I think we, we, we do work very closely with the CCG and uh, we have, a, 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 I think, a very uh, positive um, uh, and good relationship. And, it, you know, CCGs are new and mm. their engagement with local authorities is very new for them. They've never been in the political arena as such. Uh, and I'm sure they find that a, a strange thing to be in. But I, I think it is a positive relationship, and we do work collaboratively around uh, analysis of the services we're, we're jointly uh, procuring or, or providing, and that, that evidence will come through through our joint information uh, departments. Uh, and we're, I've not seen anything yet, that, as I chair the Health and Wellbeing Board, nothing has been brought there to raise concerns about... Um, the delivery of some of the pilot schemes we're doing or involved with and any proposals going forward. I think that you know, there are exciting things to do and we want to embrace those, but it's the, at the more strategic level around the provision of healthcare, certainly acute care, that we're really concerned about. 
and we may be at odds with the CCG on that. So are you satisfied then that you are able to measure as services come on stream how successful each particular service is? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm certain that we will be able to do that with the CCG, yes. Now, I wanted to ask you about the social care side of things. Uh, can you help us with to what extent out-of-hospital services in the borough are dependent upon provision which comes from the local authority uh, and whether or not there are resources available to underpin that? Just okay. before you answer, I'm sorry, uh, another request is to keep voices up in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier about our um, working with the CCG and our partnership and our commitment and I do stress that we have an absolute commitment and we have a very um, common agenda in terms of making sure that we provide the best possible health care for our residents. And in terms of um, adult social care, uh, obviously we are part of the Better Care Fund uh, uh, framework uh, and process and we have been involved in that for, for a while from the outset and we have extremely uh, good relationship and working because obviously there are lots of projects within the Better Care Fund which will deliver um, good outcomes for our residents. It is early stages uh, but there's nothing to indicate that um, that that should be a problem in terms of working and getting good results. We have a very good partnership for working with them and I think they have involved us, the CCG, in, in terms of um, making sure that we are fully um, understanding what's happening. And this will only work if um, the local authority and the CCG work together. I, I, I think we've even if we didn't want to work together, we are driven to work together because of, of the Better Care Fund requirements and the projects in place that are dependent on, on us working together. I wanted to touch on an issue that you've already mentioned, which is the population changes. Am I correct that one of the concerns that you have is about the, the growth of the population and the impact that they, that may have had on the... Uh, the, the, the facts, the factual estimates and the, fa the figures that underpin the system. Yes, sorry, uh, yes that's correct. I think that uh, when the case was made originally for, for, for change, it did, I don't think it adequately took into account population growth. And as we all know, in London there's been a significant increase right across the board and that will continue. So we think in the estimate, uh, estimate of around 10, 10 to 12,000 uh, underestimate on the original figures for population growth. So is it, is it likely then that the, um, the West Middlesex uh, University Hospital, the, the emergency care facilities there, are going to be fully used up by the people who, who already come from the area with that increased population? Uh, and so uh, what does that say about the capacity to take patients from elsewhere if, for example, Ealing and uh, Charing Cross are unable to continue with their services? Yes, I think there's a, there's a huge risk, um, and as Councillor Collins said earlier, you know, we had a mild winter. We didn't have a few a flu uh, outbreak of any significance, uh, and we were still uh, up against it uh, right across uh, London on providing healthcare. So, I think with the population growth, uh, not having uh, the necessary GP availability, it, certainly in Hounslow, Councillor Bath always alluded to the fact that. People are complaining about waiting time to GPs. Um, we haven't seen a significant improvement in the uh, out-of-hospital services, w which would then relieve the pressure on West Middlesex Hospital. So any further closures of A&Es in this part of London will be um, a mistake, I think, at this stage. I wanted to just ask you about um, transport because you cover this very briefly in your submission. Um, do you only have any views about the increase on travel times if Chelsea and Westminster services are reduced? Yeah, yeah um, <coughs> travel times are, um, are difficult anyway and, I th and again as Councillor uh, Collins alluded to if you're elderly or frail that uh, makes it more different but um, I think travel times are a significant uh, play a significant part in people's decisions of where they go to receive health care uh, and we know, uh, we we'll all know anecdotally how difficult it is to travel around um, this part of London anyway and uh, movements of patients I think uh, across 
borough boundaries need to be understood, why people do it. Um, and we have obviously a close relationship with uh, Richmond, who's been alluded to, and why they were involved in the process. Uh, and people do move to, I think, from parts of our borough. They may go to Richmond, they may go to their walking centres, etc. So understanding why people move around, uh, why they move, and how they use public transport to access healthcare needs more detailed look at the moment. I don't think it's clear. Do you, do you have concerns about uh, whether there will be any disproportionate effect on poorer or more deprived areas? I think it's more, more likely that that will happen. Um, people from those areas are less likely or, or be or, or unwilling to travel longer distances to receive health care. Um, Travelling is not cheap, so uh, I think people will um, make decisions around cost and accessibility uh, when using transport um, and, the, and their decisions around how they receive health care. It's very challenging for those particular groups. And is there, is there any particular group or area that you identify uh, as being particularly vulnerable in that aspect of things? Yeah, um, it, it's going back to um, our population um, in the borough and um, our population has, has been growing for quite a while and we've also, in fact, I think that um, I was reading somewhere that we're the fifth highest in London, so it's a population growth that obviously we need to, uh, need, need to keep an eye on in terms of what, what kind of services and health services that they will require. And I think what worries me is so, uh, in terms of the population growth, in terms of the age group, we, all, we have a, a, a lot of younger um, age group in terms of families and babies that will need health care, but we've also got an older population as well. And I, th I think that um, in, in terms of the transport, uh, I think as the, the leader said, I think there needs to be more analysis of what exactly, how do people get to and from around the borough and, and accessing health services because particularly from my experience, um, so many more uh, people, residents who are trying to access services, particularly those who have, who have sort of long-term illnesses are having so many difficulties in, even with hospital transport. And if that is something that you're using on a regular basis, then <coughs> that worries me because is there then a tendency <coughs> for people to think, well, actually, I won't access services because it, it, it's just so difficult to do that. So I think there needs to be a greater understanding of how, is that, how that is working. And I, and I think I'm particularly worried about um, how this will impact on the very young, the families and, and, and the elderly um, uh, in, in the borough. Um, I don't know whether you can help on this or not. It occurred to me that this is a borough which is close to the Heathrow Airport, and of course we don't know whether there will be an extra runway at Heathrow or Gatwick, and that's very much a matter for uh, others. But of course, I, I wonder whether you had a view about whether that would have an impact on, for example, your population and also transport links, um, if there was disruption caused, say, by... Um, the, uh, an additional runway, and whether that's something you think needs to be factored in and thought about? Uh, certainly we're thinking about that at the moment. We're looking and, uh, at the, and we are developing our master plan for uh, the west part of the borough. Uh, we're working with Heathrow Airport Limited on that. Uh, I'm not sure uh, health services have even thought about that yet. Uh, I think they're way behind on, on the curve on that. Uh, and if there is a, an expansion of Heathrow, uh, then we will need to ensure that there's adequate transport, uh, that's an essential part, uh, but also of healthcare. And I don't think the health service uh, is ready for that in any shape or form. I've certainly not had any dialogue with anyone about how we will uh, deal with a population explosion if the third runway comes to Heathrow. So, it, in fact, am I correct in saying that if that were to happen, it would be completely transformative of the area? Absolutely. I, I just wanted to ask you very briefly uh, about the business case. As a local authority, what do you say about the wisdom of proceeding with major changes such as selling off land without having had sight of the business plan? I think it's foolhardy. And finally, just in relation to the issue of governance, one of the things you say in your submission is that the local authority has been unsighted 
about shaping a healthier future. Could, could you just expand on that a little, please? Well, I've already, um, as I already mentioned earlier, you know, I don't think there's an engagement uh, at the right level with local authorities and health services. We obviously, we've mentioned about our good working relationship with the CCG. Uh, um, I think that's really positive. But as I say, there's, I'm concerned, and London lead, some other London leaders are concerned about the uh, formation of super CCGs. Uh, and as always in the health service, it goes in circles. And then we'll have regional CCGs. Uh, and I think that they're all but, all but named, and they're making decisions about health services in my borough that I know nothing about, about and I have no engagement with and I think that's a real concern and should be a concern for everyone. So o over and above the JOSC um, scrutiny, what scrutiny mechanisms would you like to see put in place? Yeah, yeah um, I, I think this is an extremely important point for us because um, in terms of what's happening at North, um, at, at, at the bigger level, is that we feel that um, there seems to be there needs to be a bit more of a holistic approach or an understanding um, across the whole London area. And um, in terms of what mechanisms would um, that would involve, I think we probably want to seek advice on that because we do have the um, obviously the the, the scrutiny, the Josh, but. We as adult, as cabinet members, are not part of that, um, and uh, there needs to be another mechanism, something in place, so that looks at the whole picture across London. Because what happens in another part of London obviously has a knock-on effect somewhere else. And I believe these are the really important um, overall issues that need to be looked at. Um, holistically before you uh, start making decisions about closing and also to have a look at what the um, pressures have been to date as a result of some of the decisions being made. So we do really support the idea of having a mechanism but we're not entirely sure what that should be. So just to add to that, I think what I'm clear about is we need to be at the table when we're not. We're, we're, we're playing second fiddle to the decision makers in health in London, and that's not acceptable. Thank you. If you'd like to wait there, there may be some questions from the commissioners. Uh, <coughs> yes, thank you very much for your presentation. I've got two questions, one specific, one more general. First one is, do you agree with the previous witness, Councillor uh, Collins, that it would be a mistake to downgrade Karen Cross, and what needs to happen is revamping? I'm putting it short, but those are his words. Do you agree with that? I think we need to understand the case for those changes and understand clearly the effects that will have on our residents and I don't think that case has been made yet. So is your answer that you do agree? The answer I've given you is the answer I've given you. <laughs> Sounds a very pol political answer, if I may say so. <laughs> That's what I am. <laughs> I know, but then you're expressing views on, on, on these matters which affect all of us. So it would be important to know what your present position is. Your present position seems to be, well, we don't know. No. Uh, uh, if you want to amplify, do Yeah, that. I can, yeah. Um, our position is that we don't think there should be any significant changes to acute care in North West London until we fully understand the effects of the two closures already taken place. And we need to have a frank and honest and open debate about that. We are not against change, and we're not obviously against about improving health care outcomes from our residents. At the moment, we don't see the evidence, we don't see the business case, it's only in draft form. We need to see much more evidence. So I don't want to paint myself into a corner, I want to be in a position where we can move in the right direction when we think it's right for our residents. Well, uh, I have the second question I have really is a follow-on from what you've just said. Uh, if out-of-hospital services are going to be regarded Again, using the previous witness's word or description as a, a pillar of this whole scheme, then do you believe that what should have happened here, if, going to, if reconfiguration of that kind is going to take place, that you need a pilot scheme first? Now, this comes from last week and a witness we heard last week. So, for example, given the needs of a particular area, 
You can't start closing acute services unless you know that urgent care centres are really going to fulfil that function, unless you know how an extended GP service is going to, in fact, satisfy the deficiency and so on. But it's, it's uh, looking at it compendiously, would it not have been better, therefore, to have a pilot scheme that embraced these changes? I fully support that view. Uh, just, just a quick question. There's a reference on page uh, 23 to of your um, submission to uh, a 30% increase from 2011 to 2013-14 in A&E attendances at West Middlesex uh, Hospital. And uh, I mean, this is a very large, by well, almost any comparison, it's certainly much larger than most of London. And I'm just wondering if there's any particular factors that you may be aware of. I know you're raising the question that you, you, there's not been answered from the NHS, but from the borough side, from the social services side and so on, are the factors that you, you're aware of that might have driven that? Um, I can, I can you know, as a lay person, can only draw the conclusion from the information given to me that it coincides with the closures of the other two A&Es. I think other people uh, will have to look at that in detail and understand that, but that's the impression I have uh, that it's too much of a coincidence. If I can just add, I mean, I, I think that is the point that we, we have been trying to make all along, is that we really need to understand why exactly we have had an increase in waiting times in A&E at West Middlesex University Hospital because that seems to coincide with the closure of the other, other acute um, uh, settings. I mean, I, when I, as I mentioned earlier, when I went to open uh, the hospital social work service, uh, which was a few weeks before Christmas at um, West Middlesex, uh, there was a, um, a, it was described as a black alert, a term which I had heard before, and um, it was very worrying to see. I mean, uh, we were trying to open a service, but every, every, obviously the, the staff were under an increased amount of pressure uh, running around trying to cope with the extra demand. And, and from, from speaking to them at that time, it was clear that they were extremely worried about the situation. And, and, and that, was, uh, that was way before Christmas. So um, I think what we, what we are saying is that we want to understand why exactly that is before any further decisions are made. Uh, I'll just point out that the, the period is from 2011-12 up to the final quarter of 2013-14. Um, and so that rather predates the closure of the a and which actually took place at the end of 2014. Uh, so I, 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 there, there must be other factors as well that at work, in addition to the closure that obviously have been talked about at some time, but it's not, not to the point that, uh, that, that those a and are actually closed. Sorry, I thought you were referring to the uh, closures of the A&Es in that time period. You're right, I, I don't know what those underlying factors are, um, but there has been, uh, a, and we all know this, an increase in demand on the health service right across London and across the country. Again, I think it's just another example of why we need to understand why has there been significant change in, uh, and increase in demand? What are the reasons? So before you make any further changes, I think we need to understand that, and I do agree with the point already made by the chairman, by a formal witness, uh, that we should have a pilot study and understand that and see how it works. Uh, we haven't got that at the moment, so I cannot be confident of why uh, or understand why those, that there was those increases in demand in that, the period you described. Also, if I can add, I mean, this is only anecdotally, is that I've grown up in this borough, and um, over the years, um, it's always appeared to me that um, West Middlesex Hospital is quite a busy hospital and, and um, in my experience of the times that I've used A&E is that his, it has appeared to be very busy and I'm talking for a very, very long time here as a person who's lived here all my life. So um, that's obviously just my experience anecdotally but it has always appeared to, to me um, to be a busy hospital anyway. Very short question. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a full understanding of the better care plan. Can you hear? Yeah. I, I don't have an understanding of how the better care plan is being used. I guess I positively, and Councillor Vance spoke positively about it. Where does the money 
uh, will better care for the compound. Because I've read that it's not new money. And if so, uh, where will the money be withdrawn from? What services will be downgraded to provide resources for better care for the compound? Thank you, yes. Um, I, I, my understanding is that it is not new money and it's money that comes from acute services. Um, and um, I, obviously we don't know what will happen in terms of the future Better Care Fund, which would be worrying as well. But what we have done is that um, we've taken the opportunity with, uh, with our partners in the CCG to make sure that we can deliver as, as best possible outcomes um, from the Better Care front, uh, Fund because obviously we totally understand the need in terms of integrated working and we have a number of projects that are part of the Better Care Fund and some of these, um, the, the, the one that I mentioned before, uh, well a couple of projects are already off the ground but yes it, is, it isn't new money, it's money that I understand has been taken out of acute services. I'm sorry, I promise to be kind of um, My worry is, just to be heard, that this is the third session, um, about all the questions that are going to be, or already there are, the questions that are going to be on acute services. And I just wondered if, if in your meetings with the CCG and other, people, other authorities, whether you come across an understanding of what services are being reduced to provide this funding? I, I think that we could probably have a better understanding of that, I think, and I, I accept that. And um, I think we are trying to make the best um, possible uh, cases for, for our residents, but um, I think you're absolutely right. I think it isn't clear in terms of what is being reduced. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much for both of you.